It's time to take a step beyond. The podcast to inspire creativity and imagination. Here's your host, Dr. Anthony Poston. Thanks for tuning in to A Step Beyond. I've been an educator for many, many years. Too many to discuss here. And during this time, one of our biggest, and I mean biggest, challenges has been trying to recruit women into STEM fields. STEM meaning science, technology, engineering, and math. Our guest today not only represents the very essence of that type of person that we need in STEM, but she also has a similar passion in life when it comes to inspiring young people, both male and female. She's the host of Exploration Outer Space on Fox. She has a bachelor's degree in both mechanical and aerospace engineering, a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics, and a master's degree in technology and policy, both from MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, the obviously incredibly smart Emily Calandrelli. Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. So let's talk first about your show, Exploration Outer Space, on Fox. So how did you get into doing that, and when does it normally air on television? Yeah, so Exploration Outer Space has been on for four seasons now. Um, It's on Fox mostly Saturday mornings, so it's syndicated, so it's on at different times in different cities, depending on where you are. Um, But, yeah, I was graduating from MIT, and I was looking for a job, as one does, And I got an email from a production company that, you know, out of the blue was like, we are looking for somebody with a strong background in aeronautics to be the new host of a new TV show about outer space. Would you like to be that person? (laughs) And so I got very, very lucky and said yes, because it just sounded like an adventure. I'd never done anything in TV before. I'd never really done anything similar to that ever before, but it sounded like a really fun way to get more people excited about science and space exploration. So I just kind of jumped on the opportunity. So if I wanted to go at, go online and watch a bunch of past episodes, where would I find those? You can actually find them streaming online on virtually every platform. It's on Hulu, it's on YouTube TV, it's on Roku, Amazon Prime, and you can get it for free on Yahoo. So if you just search Exploration Outer Space, you will find it on many different platforms online. Well, that's fantastic. Now, my understanding is you were nominated for a Daytime Emmy for this show, right? That's right. Yeah, last year, one of my favorite episodes that we do, um, it was a pet project of mine. It was kind of a new type of episode that my production company had never done before. It was sort of a risk that we were taking because, you know, it was just... When you find something that works in TV, you don't typically change it. And so changing something was definitely a big risk that we were taking. Um, And it was our student astronaut episode where we basically held a a nationwide contest to find a really awesome science student and give them an opportunity, a free opportunity to help launch their career in the space industry. Um, It was kind of like the nerdiest American Idol And that um, episode that we did last year, we gave them a free ride on the Vomit Comet, which is that aircraft that basically makes the people inside feel like they're astronauts. It's like an eight-foot roller coaster in the sky. Pretty crazy. Um, And we gave that opportunity to a really awesome physics student uh, who who wants to work in the space industry. And that's the episode that we won, um, or we got nominated, rather, for an Emmy for. Well, I've never been on the vomit comet, and I joined the Air Force to be to be an astronaut, which never happened. May I add, <laughs> sticking NASA, you know. But I did fly around and pull some G's in an F one eleven, so I know what it feels like to go up and down, and uh, you know, and do those weightless feelings every now and then. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so, yeah, it's crazy. So you were all you've also been frequently seen as a correspondent on the show Bill Nye Saves the World on Netflix. Tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, Bill has been around for a long time, and as a kid, he was definitely one of my idols, like most kids uh, that grew up in my generation, and so having the opportunity to work with him today is, you know, nothing less, nothing short of a dream come true for me, especially as a science communicator. He is kind of like the pinnacle of what it means to be an effective science communicator in my field. Um, so it's been really great to watch him and his elements and watch him be a master of his craft 
And so as a field correspondent for him, I get to go to different parts of the country, different parts of the world to cover science stories um, for him. And then we just finished, let's see, we just finished season two, which will air, I believe, sometime in December. All right. So I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm trying to get my arms around this. You're literally traveling, traveling the world then to be like a news correspondent for Bill Nye. Is that correct? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, um, he sent me to India and I got to visit India and find like all of the awesome ways that India is excelling in science and also space exploration. I covered three different stories in India for him. I covered a space exploration story where I went to this incredible Indian company that wants to send a robot to the moon. Um, they are, you know, a contender to be the first private company to ever do this, which would be really crazy. Um, so I got to do that. I got to go to different rotary programs and show off how India has, um, you know, eradicated polio from their country, which was one of, you know, it's a Herculean effort because India is just such a huge country. There's so many rural areas. There's a number of factors as to why it was such a crazy accomplishment for them to eradicate polio from their country. So I did a segment on, on vaccines um, for him. And then I also did a, a segment on how India in many ways is leading, at least in the private sector, for uh, like women's issues in the workplace. So there was a lot of different, you know, I kind of spanned the gamut on different scientific issues for Bill, which is why his show was so great, because there are so many different types of topics that he covers that, you know, if you're going to watch it, you're bound to find something that you are really intrigued by. You know, that, that's actually very, very cool. So but I want to shift gears here a minute. Um, away from television to get into some something else. Let, let's get into the core of where your passions lie, which coincidentally I think lie next to mine. Um, I know you want to inspire people, whether it's women pursuing a career in STEM, Matt, maybe, or maybe just people increasing what you would call their level of scientific literacy. So let's first talk about women in STEM. I know that you didn't originally plan to get into a STEM field yourself, right? Let's talk about that for a bit. Yeah, when I was little, I wasn't like a huge sciencey kid. I didn't, you know, launch uh, model rockets. I didn't like join the math club. I didn't do any of that stuff when I was a kid. It wasn't until I got older that I found myself liking it. I kind of fell into it because I was good at math in high school, um, and I wanted to get a good job after I graduated college. And I read online that engineers consistently made one of the highest salaries of people that got bachelor degrees in America. And so I was like, being the, you know, overly logical person that I was, I was like, okay, math, engineers use math, engineers make money, we'll do engineering. <laughs> and once I got into engineering, I just found so many cool opportunities for people that wanted to do engineering in the space industry. And so NASA just had all of these incredible internships and research fellowships and opportunities to travel and all of these things that a student could do for free. And so that just like hooked me and I have never gone back. I have been pretty obsessed with space exploration and the space industry ever since. Okay. So as a successful, and I'm using that word in a major way because it's true, in a very, in, as a successful woman in a STEM field, what do you think we need to do to get more women into STEM fields? Now, now talk freely here because I'm taking lots of notes as an educator. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's really a hard issue because I have friends that are now CEOs of space companies, and they are, you know, like female CEOs of space companies, and it is a near and dear issue to their heart as well. And so these are people that, you know, innately have this desire to hire women, and they cannot find them. Um, and so once we get to the point where, you know, you're looking for people to hire and you just can't find the women, um, it's an issue that has started, you know, long before that point. It's an issue that starts really when they're in middle school, sometimes earlier in grade school. Um, and so, you know, there's so many different aspects to this problem. Um, but in my mind, from what I've seen, it seems like we really need to start at a much younger age. Um, you know, primarily late elementary school and middle school, because various studies have shown that this is the point where girls stop, they drop off in their interest for science. And that could be maybe because, you know, 
there are so many other things going on at that age that you're self-conscious about literally everything that, especially for a girl, um, the stigma about being a nerdy scientist or an engineer, maybe that's just something that they don't want to add to their plate. So I think there's a stigma aspect that can be helpful for both girls and guys that we could remove um, about what being a scientist or an engineer looks like, what it means. Um, and then I also think that we need to find more opportunities to reach out to girls because it starts at that age where it becomes science and engineering and all of these like after school programs. It very quickly becomes a boys club. And it doesn't sound super fun to be the only girl in a room full of boys, especially when you're, you know, like 11 years old. So I think we need to do a lot of programs that reach out specifically at girls. Um, you know, all girl type of robotics teams, all girl uh, math and science clubs, and things like my book that I came out with recently, the Ada Lace series, where we have, um, you know, a media uh, like product that kids can read about and see this female who's the lead in the book, Ada Lace, who loves science and engineering. Because one of the other problems, you know, stigma and then boys club, the other issue there, I think, is that they don't have many role models to look up to in media. We don't have a lot of female scientists and engineers in film or TV or books that kids read about, and it doesn't become normal for them to, you know, imagine a woman or a girl to be interested in science and engineering. So one of the ways that I'm trying to combat that is with this kids' book series. You know, I... Um... I fully agree with you that we got to start younger, which is why, you know, we, we, we just built a huge makerspace um, for targeted at people of all ages, but mostly kids. Um, and we're going to use that to hopefully recruit a lot of young women, you know, a lot of girls into this, in, into the STEM fields because they will have a chance to come in, create stuff from their, you know, with their hands, uh, whether it's electronics or, you know, they use a 3D printer, or whatever, whatever the case might be, but it's a tactile, you know, um, tangible activity that, that hopefully you know, they'll find some passion for at, at a young age and keep going with it. And we're going to do clubs around it. So I agree with you 100%. It starts with Young Young. And you mentioned your book series um, about Ada Lace, which for our guests, um, for our listeners, is a third, she's a third grade, right? A third grade inventor and scientist yep. who you say has, right. has a knack for science and technology and a nose for trouble. So you, <laughs> I believe you have two books out so far, right? Yeah, we've written five, um, and only the first two are out right now. The third book comes out in May. So um, tell me about that process. I mean, so you create the stories, and then where do you go from there? Yeah, it's been a really creative process, because I was somebody that grew up um, loving the arts and loving, like, the creative aspect of me. That's something that I've kind of struggled with as going a student going into engineering is that, it feels almost like you have to put that side of you away when you become an analytical scientist or an engineer. So now I have this awesome project where I can now leverage that creative side of me. And so how it works is I work with like a professional children's book writer and I come up with the plot and the characters and all of the science. And we work together to craft a plot and a story that has real science, fact check science, um, and a really engaging story to effectively, our hope is to create, you know, accidental learning where the kid is so engaged in the story and the drama and the suspense that they don't realize that they're learning about science. And so at the end of the book, um, I put in every single book a science glossary where I actually infuse some of my like personal anecdotes of working with this technology or my way that I've become familiar with whatever technology I'm putting in the book. And I put it in, I write it in first person. So I'm trying to connect with the readers, the kids as like, hey, I'm the author. Oh, also, I have a background in science and engineering. And I wrote this really cool book. And look at all the science that I've used. This is the same science that Ada is using in the book. So the whole thing has been a really cool project, and it's been fun to, like, go to schools and do readings and interact with kids that are like, I love science, and it's been so fun to read this book. It was great. And, it's yeah, it's been a very, like, rewarding project for me. You know, you also do um, 
have a focus on adults too. You know, I've heard you speak and you talk about the need for people to increase what you call their scientific literacy. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think everybody. So the way that I think about it is that there became a time in history where it became normal for the average person to learn how to read and write. It became normal for people to grow their own reading and writing literacy, right? And at a certain extent, it becomes embarrassing if you don't do that, if you can't do that well, right? Um, It just, that is something that has become a standard and a norm for a citizen in this country. You know how to read and write. Um, And I think the next wave of literacy is going to become scientific literacy, where we understand the basic concept of global warming, for example. It makes sense to all of us. We understand the physics and the chemistry behind it so that nobody can pull the wool over our eyes and trick us into believing something else for their own benefit, for their own, you know, incentives and usually monetary incentives. Um, I think it will become a defense mechanism and a way of survival, a means of survival, Mm -hmm. to learn science, um, at least at a very basic level. I mean, there are people that get PhDs and literature and English and, you know, get really dive into the grammar of writing but the general citizen doesn't do that. We just go to a basic level that we can, we need to survive, and we stop there. I think the same thing will happen for science. Um, so for everything from genetically modified foods to climate change to vaccinations, a lot of these things affect our health and affect our well-being and our children's well-being and the world's well-being and all of these things. It's in our best interest to at least have a basic understanding of science. Okay, so let's talk a bit about your basic understanding of science. I've, I've had the honor of getting to know about a half dozen or so of the Apollo astronauts, and one in particular, in fact, is a dear friend of mine. So I'm a little nostalgic when it comes to the U.S. manned space program, you know, especially like Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. I also think there are many lessons we can take from that program and apply in a variety of today's leadership contexts. In fact, I may have even written a book about it. Um, you're, a, you're a strong proponent of today's private commercial space industry. I know you are. What lessons do you think they should take from the past as they blaze forward into a new territory? Um, I mean, there are a lot of technological achievements that, like, government top-down run programs have achieved, right? I mean, the Apollo program is a huge milestone of that achievement. Um, So I think that private companies can build on what's been done before. We can learn from mistakes of the past, things like Challenger and Columbia, and, you know, understand how management plays a role in a lot of these, what we typically think of as engineering problems. But in reality, it's actually a mix of technology problems and also management problems. So, you know, the government and NASA and this traditional way of doing things, they've paved a path for private companies to be able to do this. Because without that government subsidized R&D, that lasted for decades, and, you know, we poured a ton of money into it because we needed to um, to make that leap in technology. Um, there wouldn't even be a way for private companies to have a role. This has happened in many different industries, namely like the uh, like aeronautics industry. This was a very similar thing that had happened. Oftentimes, the government has to play a role because the technology leap is so great that it requires so much funding and so much time for research and development that, you know, a company that's focused on being profitable couldn't do it themselves. So I think there's always going to be a role for that traditional government-run program. There's always going to be a need for that, you know, as long as we continue to want to make giant technological leaps. But now the government has found a way to do things like low earth orbit exploration and they don't, and maybe we shouldn't be using our tax dollars to make the government be doing that for us. Maybe now that we have the technology down, we should hand all of those responsibilities over to a company who can turn a profit by doing that because we, the private companies have learned from the government how to do it. And now they can focus on making it a business, making it faster and cheaper and more reliable and all of these things to turn a profit. 
Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from the past, but now I think the government can also, in turn, learn a lot from commercial development. They have a lot of different um, people working on these problems now. A lot of diversity has been infused into the development of technologies in the space industry. So, you know, it's a partnership. It's definitely uh, not an either-or scenario. It's a, it's like an and-both scenario. We need both uh, government partnerships and also private partnerships to explore in an efficient and sustainable way. You know, it's funny because uh, I was just having a conversation a couple of weeks ago with L. Warden. Um, he went to the moon to Apollo 15, and I was talking to him about, you know, when, when did things start changing at NASA? And he said, you know, during the '60s, um, they were just—they were also goal-oriented. They weren't—they weren't concerned about bureaucracy. They weren't as concerned about paperwork. They weren't concerned about all these types of things because they had so many deadlines to meet and things were moving so fast. They were so fluid. They just—they just couldn't wait around for that kind of stuff. So the creativity flourished during that time period. He said, once they got, you know, once Congress started cutting their budget and everything and everything was started being contracted. That's when creativity, innovation went down the down the toilet, so to speak. He said that um, uh, everybody started, you know, getting into silos. They started protecting their own. It, it got really bureaucratic. He said, you know, just to just to hop a plane to fly to a, a production facility across country required massive amounts of paperwork and time, whereas before it was just a phone call down to the flight line. He'd jump and go. Um, and, and I think that contributed some to obviously the Challenger and Columbia problems because you know the, the increased bureaucracy at NASA, where a smaller company uh, in, the, in the private sector has less of that, um, which is why a lot of big IT companies tend to buy small companies and, and their innovations because they were too large to create it, whereas a small you know little nimble company that's floor fluid can do so. Right. So okay, where do you think we'll be in ten years? Oh, in 10 years, I think that will be like, well, hopefully sooner than that. I'm, I'm hoping five years will be an inflection point in the number of people going into space. Because on the horizon right now, we have companies like Virgin Orbit. We have um, Virgin Galactic. We have Blue Origin. We have SpaceX. All of these companies that are hoping to bring humans um, into space, but not just astronauts, but paying customers. And someone like Virgin Galactic, for example, has sold over, I think, 800 tickets now, which is more than the number of humans who have gone into space in history. So once Virgin Galactic starts getting those people up, they will more than double the number of humans who have seen our Earth from beyond our atmosphere. And I think that will have a really tangible impact on our culture as a species, as Earthlings, when more and more of our people can see our planet from, you know, the scary vacuum of space and realize how fragile and finite this planet that we call home is. And so, yeah, I think that's going to be a really cool time in our lives because little kids will grow up seeing these, like, teen stars that they love. Like, for example, people who have bought tickets are like Justin Bieber and Katy Perry and Ashton Kutcher and all of these people that kids know and love and once those people go into space and become astronauts everybody will start thinking about space differently and so yeah i'm excited for that in the next five to ten years that's that's what i foresee is like the biggest change in space exploration is that people that we feel that we have a connection to um are going to be sharing their experiences about space exploration Uh, how long do you think it would take us to get to mars and should we even go Um, I don't know. That's like, that is an issue that I've thought about for a while. And I think Mars, and at least in the current framework of the like administrative uh, bureaucracy at NASA, um, Mars will perpetually be 20 years away. Um, I am in the mindset that I think the moon is a really attractive option instead um, for one reason. And that reason is not because I think it is is a stepping stone for Mars, because I do not think those arguments really hold up. Um, So the people that say that we should go to the moon first because it's a great stepping stone for Mars um, are not maybe thinking through that argument very well because it's not the best stepping stone for Mars. Um, I think we should go to the moon because I think that would help 
spur economic development in the private industry. We have a lot of private companies that are already investing in technologies that are moon-based. Uh, we don't have too many companies that can afford to go all the way to Mars or are even focusing on technologies that would be Martian-based. And so I think if we focus our government resources on going to the moon, that would help bring a lot of private companies along and maybe even boost um, lunar economic development. So I'm in the mindset that maybe we should focus on going to the moon rather than going to Mars at this point. But if we went anywhere, I would be happy. (laughs) I think that the government is just not very um, effective with NASA at this point. And so I don't have, I'm not super optimistic. That's why a lot of people are really excited about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and these billionaires who are investing their own money in these types of efforts because in many ways they are our only hope of getting to these destinations because NASA is is maybe not going to, with the tug of war of bureaucracy and, you know, political um, backdoor meetings and all of these things, it just feels like it's impossible to get people to focus on an effective program to get to either of those locations at NASA. So, yeah, um, I'm hopeful, but if we were to do it, I would focus on the moon. You know, what bugs me is there are many, many economists that will say that the investment we made into the Apollo program, uh, because of all the products and all the and all the services that were developed that have since come out of that program over the years that are now just normal things in our everyday life that we all take for granted, that the, that the return on investment for the Apollo program was, was as high as 15 to 1. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. And, you know, the reality is you find me a 15 to 1 investment today, I am all in. So and it's one of the it's been one of the few governmental programs that actually has a positive ROI. So despite that, and, and, and they also said the space program is, is, in its entirety has an 8 to 1 return on investment, but it amazes me how little budget they keep giving to NASA every year to help develop all this stuff going forward. It's been a proven winner economically since the beginning. So you, know, you, you talk about how, because Ashton Kutcher and people like that who are popular and, you know, and young people look up to them, if they're excited about space and that will, here's an alternative. Instead of going to Mars, as I see technology changing and, you know, with virtual reality and augmented reality and, and uh, artificial intelligence, all these things that are expanding and, and getting better by the day and holographic imaging and so on and so forth, I, I think it'd be better to send a whole bunch of equipment down to the surface of Mars, which we obviously can do, and basically create recreate Mars on Earth, so to speak, so everybody can share and, 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 and basically participate and feel it and experience it. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it could be cool. Mars is a really boring planet. Um, just well, so like is the moon. Speaking. <laughs> M- moon's pretty boring, too. Um, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think if you physically went there, you would know as a person you were on a completely different planet, and it would be like just an incredible out-of-body experience, I'm sure. Um, but, like, looking at Mars, it just... I mean, scientifically fascinating, wonderful, ge- ge- uh, geologically, like, fascinating. But, like, just aesthetically, it just kind of looks like you're in a desert. Um, so maybe, I don't know, virtual reality, if you can add, like, an experience of launching um, and even maybe training as an astronaut and really get the, per- the user in the mindset of, like, I'm going on this dangerous exploration mission, like, this is going to be crazy, and then you go into a habitat and you have to put a spacesuit on and you just go through the whole experience. Um, that could be cool. That I would definitely be on board for that. Okay, so you know, you're you're passionate about working with young people and doing children's books and so on, and you talk to young people I'm sure all the time. And you have a show on Saturday morning that obviously caters more to young people because that's who watches television on mm-hmm. Saturday on Saturday mornings. So I'm a sports fan, but I'm not a fanatic. I mean, one of the things that really gets on my nerves today is the overall the growing obsession of sports, especially by parents who all seem to think that their son or daughter will one day play professionally, which we all know is probably not going to happen. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm overgeneralizing here, but the reality is I've seen enough parents do this and to know that they tend to live vicariously through them. They slip them from one town to the next, whether it's through the school or AAU or whatever. And it ultimately leaves very little time for those kids to be creative or follow other you know, endeavors or interests. So what do you think the long-term solution to this problem is? Or maybe you don't think it's a problem at all. 
Oh, I definitely think it's a problem. I think that is you like hit the nail on the head there. I think that's one of the problem that problems that is uniquely bad for like Western society, specifically the United States, is that we have such an emphasis on sports growing up. It's like wild how much time and energy and like I had friends that did traveling soccer programs. And, you know, I ran cross country and I did track and I was never really good at any of those things, but they didn't actually take all that much time that those were sports that I could do after school. Um, But these traveling programs where you do go to different states like every weekend, I think it's so troubling, not just because of the time spent, but the mentality that, you know, this is what it means to be like a successful person in my life at this moment. Um, And I think that's more of a cultural issue than anything. I don't have a good way to um, address it other than the fact that, you know, we can't address a problem unless we know that it exists. And I don't think that people think that this is a problem. Um, So maybe even talking about how this is a unique issue to the United States, others, um, other countries in the world do not put such an emphasis on this. And perhaps that is one of the reasons that United States is lagging on math and science um, in grade schools across the country, uh, you know, relative to other nations around the world. Um, so, yeah, there, I, did, I watched a TED Talk on this topic where this woman argued that that is, that is the reason that the United States is lagging behind in math and science, because other countries put that emphasis, that same emphasis that we put on sports, on math and science. And so that is one of the reasons why they are doing very well. Um, Their students are doing well comparatively. So I don't know. what I honestly, I do not know what the um, solution is other than continuing to tell kids that maybe the probability of becoming a professional um, sports player is not very high. Maybe trying to use those numbers as a means of communicating, hey, this is fun for now and it should be fun, but just so you know, you should probably get good at something else because this is not likely to be your future. Okay, I am very passionate about inspiring people of all ages, not just kids, but parents and adults and, you know, whoever. And I want them, to be, I want them all to become the best version of themselves, you know, whatever that is. So, and that's part of the reason for this podcast. So, if you were speaking to a large audience of young people, maybe college students or whatever, what would you say to help inspire them to something greater? Yeah, um, my best piece of advice, I think, to anyone is to do things in life that make you uncomfortable, that make you kind of nervous, specifically like career related things. Don't go to like a dark place at night because you feel uncomfortable. Um, because I've found that the biggest successes in life, the things that you feel most proud about are things that you went into feeling uncomfortable, feeling like maybe you weren't prepared enough, like maybe you weren't the right person for the job, going into it with, you know, this mindset of imposter syndrome. But the things that are hard are going to be worth it. And so if you can find these opportunities in life where you feel uncomfortable, Um, then you are likely to make yourself a better person and probably make your life more interesting Um, because that's where you do things you've never done before and try things that you've never done before and meet new people and make new friends and all of these things. So, yeah, biggest piece of advice is to find opportunities that will make you uncomfortable. You you know, one of the things I noticed about your educational career while you were in college is the large number of internships, and you mentioned this earlier in the podcast, um, the large number of internships you had within the time you were in college. I mean, you went from Disney to NASA to uh, the Truman Foundation in D.C., and even a trip to China sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Yeah. What were your biggest takeaways from these experiences, and do you recommend them for all college students? Yeah, I mean, specifically for engineering students, um, you know, engineering students have it pretty good because all of these internships are paid, Um, I know that that is something that weighs on students' minds a lot, especially with the amount of debt they are likely to go into. Um, And so not everybody can take an unpaid internship, and unpaid internships are the norm across many different majors. So if you're lucky enough to find an internship that pays, that will be your competitive edge when you go out to apply for jobs. Because if you can have a diverse set of internships in different places, 
It will show that you are comfortable with uncertainty. You are comfortable with being uncomfortable. You can go to a new place and learn the ropes quickly and do well. Um, And so, yeah, I would recommend doing internships nearly every single summer if you can um, to build that resume, to get those experiences, to make new friends. Um, And also just it's a great excuse to travel the world um, for free generally if you're doing engineering internships. So, yeah, I would absolutely recommend it. Well, you know, and I also believe that, you know, young people, especially college freshmen, sophomore, you know, we expect them to figure out after high school what they want to be when they grow up. You know, we say, hey, you, sh- you should know this by now, so go major in this. Whereas a lot of students just don't know, and they're not going to know for a while, um, which means that they probably should experiment. They should probably play with some things. They should probably test drive a number of different careers, which I, I love job shadowing for young people. I also, I also think it's important to do internships just because they get the chance to test drive certain types of careers. So, yeah, I, I think doing different things, um, maybe even things that, as you say, make you uncomfortable, is a good way for young people to start thinking about careers so they have a feel for what's really best for them versus the number, the, the huge number of college students who basically come out of college with a degree they don't use, unlike you, for yeah, example. Definitely. So I noticed that uh, you were recently named by Adweek Magazine as one of the top 10 or so celebrities raising the bar for creativity. And you were in very good, I'm saying very good company in this list because it included <laughs> – Melissa McCarthy, Donald Glover, Jordan Peele, and the very funny Camille Najani, who's on Silicon Valley. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do you think they saw in you that put you into this category? Well, I think that I am a bit unique in the fact that there are not a lot of people with a science and an engineering background that have great communication skills. Um Studying engineering for eight years has given me the experience to know that that is true. Um, There are a lot of characters on the Big Bang Theory in real life, but not all of us are like that. And so I think that the fact that I'm trying to leverage that skill set across different types of mediums, whether it be on TV or Netflix or YouTube or my books, um, just trying to find different types of ways to reach people with science, um, I think maybe that's why I was on that list because I am trying to find, I know that different people learn differently. And so to reach a wider net, to cast a wider net, to reach more people, I need to be on all of these different types of platforms. And so by leveraging that, hopefully I am, I don't know, raising the bar for creativity when it comes to science communication. You know, what do you do to stay creative? Do you, have a, do you have a trick or a secret? Um, get a lot of sleep. <laughs> Honestly, I never, I try to never wear myself out. Um, and it really just comes to self, like self care. And so, honestly, that's, I think that's a really important aspect getting, getting sleep, getting exercise, taking care of yourself. Because if you're tired and you're irritated, um, you're not going to find that like calm space in your mind to think of a cool new idea so for me it's it's just you know taking it slow and not getting too crazy and wrapped up in life and career and just you know taking those moments to rest and let your mind wander okay so it's time for the lightning round i i ask this of all my guests so i'm going to go through a list of either ors and i want you to pick the one that comes to your mind first okay are you ready? Okay. Phone call or text? Text, always. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. I hate waking up early. Television shows or movies? Oh, God. I mean, shoot. I watch a lot of both. Um, I guess I guess movies because I just can't imagine my weekends without them. Facebook or Twitter? Mm, Twitter. Toilet paper, over or under? Oh, the people that care about that should really stop. Like, they need to find more important things to care about. <laughs> I don't think I would ever know. You gotta what pick I one, know. over or under? Um, under, because I don't, I don't, they even know what, the, yeah, I don't even know what that means. I don't okay. care. <laughs> Grilled or pan fried? What is it? Grilled or pan fried? Uh, pan fried. Grilled. Seems like more challenging. I don't really cook. I don't know. High tech or low tech? 
high tech. Oh, Nickelback or the Stones? What is that one? Nickelback or the Stones? I don't even know who the Stones are, but I the think Rolling like, Stones. Like, you don't know the oh, Rolling, Rolling Stones? Stone. Yes. Um, I don't. I'm not a music person. These are like not really catered to my interest. Um, I guess people hate Nickelback, so I guess Rolling Stones. Okay, so you're basing your response on what other people think. Yeah, because okay. I don't know anything about the subject. So All right. going with Call of Duty or Call thinks. of Duty or Pac Man. Pac Man. Sweet or salty? Sweet. And here's the biggie. Star Trek or Star Wars? Mm, I wasn't really a fan of either growing up. Um, but I guess like Star Wars because now they actually have a ton of diverse characters in their cast. So definitely have become a reborn Star Wars fan. All right, Emily, I want to thank you uh, for the time you spent with me today. Let me end the show by asking you this. You were on the far right I would say one percentile of the bell curve when it comes to success. I mean, you've especially this, especially the success that during your years in college, followed by how you actually used your college education in a very productive way. What would you say to either a high school senior or college freshman to help them realize a greater level of success during and after school? I would just tell them to try lots of different types of things. Um, one thing I did in college was I joined like. 10 different types of clubs and then only participated actively in like one or two of them because I realized that the rest of them just weren't for me. So take the time and effort to try lots of different types of things so that you can self-correct, know what know what's out there and follow things that you're interested in. Well, thank you again, Emily. I do appreciate your time and, and I know you're very, very, very busy. So thanks for being on the show. You are a living example of what I would say following your passion looks like. And you should be very proud of what you have accomplished at such a very young age. And I would encourage anyone to go online and watch your show. It's very well done and very informative. And thank you all for listening and taking a step beyond with us. I believe that passion is at the core of greatness. I've also said many times that if you're doing what you're passionate about, you will never work a day in your life. Whether you're a parent, an educator, neighbor, television personality, it becomes a responsibility of everyone to help people of all ages to learn how to both identify and follow those passions. Like the old, it takes the village mentality. So imagine the kind of world we'd be living in today if everyone actually followed their passions. I hope you'll continue to listen to A Step Beyond and become inspired to be the very best version of yourself. I'm your host, Anthony Postian. Follow your dreams. Thanks for listening to A Step Beyond. Take a moment, if you would, and leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with those who need to be inspired to become more creative and imaginative in everything they do.